So, uh, I don't know what happened there, but... <laughs> Same thing that happened last week. Yeah. I I don't know. But anyway, it uh, welcome. Hey, we're glad that you're <laughs> here. And uh, we just want to remind you uh, that um, we need you to uh, like and subscribe uh, to our channel. And, uh, I mean, you could do it right now. It's just, you know, below the the video is the like and subscribe button. If you punch on that, it's going to help us out um, with the um, finding new new listeners. So there you go. My name is Greg Fisher, and uh, I'm one half of the fourth watch of the night. We call it the fourth watch of the night because that is the watch when men sleep deepest and thieves come in. Uh, to steal and to destroy. And so we are on the fourth watch of the night. And I'm telling you, thieves are coming in and stealing the faith of people. And we are watchmen who are saying, hey, wake up. You're losing some important and valuable uh, things in terms of your faith. And with me, is a very, very nice lady, uh, Linda Morse. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And if you came to us on Facebook, we're also on YouTube on Gregory, Greg Fisher is how you have it, I think. Yeah, it's and, at Greg Fisher if you want to find me on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I'm at For Right Stuff. Uh, I think there's like a 992 or 994 after it. <laughs> there's a lot of right stuffs. Anyway, thank you for joining us. We're delving back into Mormons because why do we care? Why do we care about all these um, thieves coming in? I mean, it's not our money they're stealing. It's not our money, our soul that they're stealing. We care because they're deceiving people that we really hope to see in heaven. We hope to see you in heaven. And you know, the Lord wants us, wants you in heaven as well. God is mm -hmm. not, God is not out condemning people or uh, banishing them to hell on a whim. Uh, someone, you know, commented on, on uh, the video for last week that, you know, what kind of God would, would uh, create all these people and then uh, send billions of them to hell just because uh, they didn't believe something that uh, we believe. And the answer to that is uh, God is not sending anybody to hell. But some people um, would be more comfortable there um, because if they made it to heaven and they were in the midst of uh, righteous people who were redeemed and participated in praise and worship of the living God, they'd feel terribly out of place. So God is not condemning anyone. He's not saying, hey, I've created, you know, how many ever billions of people and two thirds of them are now going to be going to hell. That, that isn't... Uh, that that isn't that isn't the word of God. When we believe that God has given us a free will to mm -hmm. make our own decisions, we have free moral agency, and God has given us free will, and and you have free will. If you want to believe whatever you want to believe, go ahead. I'm not condemning you, and uh, God has given you that. Ca that capability, that free moral agency. And you also um, can receive the blessings from making your free will decisions. And sometimes, as we all know, when we're making free will decisions, some things don't turn out so good. They turn out to be poor choices. I do have to say, you said that they'd be more comfortable not in heaven. I don't think that being not in heaven is going to be any form of comfortable. 
I, I kind of, I guess the way I would describe it is there's two doors. God gave you two doors, two choices. And he says, I'd love for you to come in here. I'd really love for you to come in my kingdom. But if you don't want to be here, take the other door. Yeah. I mean, that's so a very that means, simplified. <laughs> that, that means evidently that, that God is, uh, you know, um, only uh, offering a binary uh, solution. And, um, and that's right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he's offering. Come and follow me. And uh, you're going to be blessed. You will uh, have righteousness in your life and order in your life, and you will have eternal life. Now, we know that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So what we're looking at right now is alleged self-proclaimed prophets who say, oh, I've got a better way. And Paul dealt with them consistently in the New Testament, repeatedly. So uh, one of the things that we've heard in our comments is that Okay, Joseph Smith, well, and in our research too, Joseph Smith was praying to know the right way, to know the true religion, which church is the best. That is an admirable prayer. It definitely is. And he based that on uh, uh, the first chapter of James' epistle in the fifth verse. Uh, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives oh. liberally. And uh, uh, and God is never going to to condemn us or make us feel bad because we were asking for wisdom. He no. gives it without any repercussions. He gives it without any any punishment. And uh, yeah, that that was an admirable thing. And I think we have to I think we have to say that uh, straight out. That was an admirable thing. Uh, no. I have a lot of friends that are Mormons and I love, I, I think the way the church takes care of its people, there are things about the church that are very admirable. Their doctrine is not one of them. The doctrine and the history, the, the, the Mormon church, the Latter-day Saints uh, make uh, a lot of truth claims. And mm -hmm. the, the problem right now is that with the internet and with all the documentations on the internet, it's very easy uh, to do research and discover that the, that the truth claims uh, don't pan out. They don't, they, they're not accurate. And, um, and right now, um, for instance, I just saw I just saw a statistical study that was done, uh, and um, in Utah, and for the first time, uh, the number of people that are uh, reporting as uh, Latter Day Saints or Mormons is uh, is uh, uh, down in the low forty percent, mm -hmm. and years ago uh, it would have been like sixty percent. Especially so, in Utah, but I will point out because we're trying to we're trying to make this fair, as you know, as fair as you can. I obviously have a bias. I admit that. Oh yeah. But if if you look at all churches right now, our society has turned away from God. So. I would bet that Christian church numbers are down as well. Probably most religions are. But we want to look at these. If you're going to invest your heart and soul into something, you want it to be worth that. You don't yeah. want to have somebody selling you fool's gold. You know, could I just point out one thing that you said and, and, sure. and, a, and kind of disagree Maybe we could uh, we could uh, agree. We can we can disagree. Yeah, um, 
because you said, you know, uh, Christian uh, churches are are uh, somehow uh, reducing in number and and the number of Christians is reducing and and maybe that's happening with all religions. Um, that's a that is an idea uh, that uh, the the modernity, the modernist people in the early 20th century were putting forth that eventually with technology and and advances in medicine and education, uh, the need for uh, re religion would eventually disappear. And a lot of people uh, just take that as a as a a hundred percent true thing. It's not. And I want to tell you that the church uh, is growing um, as never before, but we don't see that in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the United States, Canada, and Europe, um, because uh, there is a decline uh, in that area, but the rest of the world, people are coming to Christ and coming to faith in Christ and becoming disciples of Christ in numbers that that were would be hard for us to understand. And that's that's a really good clarification. I, I agree with that point that what we see here in the Western Hemisphere is an apathy among believers. Well, it's just an apathy altogether. Uh, mainly because uh, people have bought into the nihilism of uh, post-modernity where nothing has any meaning and life has no meaning, no purpose. And when you don't have a purpose for your life or a meaning for your life, um, you're just out there floating around and whatever storm comes and pushes you along uh, is So let's get on to uh, our discussion of Mormonism. Okay, so we had talked. Then, while, we you're, in, hmm? while you're introducing this, I'm going to run and get a glass of water. Okay. And I'll be right back. Okay. So we had gone in a little bit into the history last time of Mormonism. It was started when Joseph Smith was seeking the true church. Uh, this was during the second great awakening when several other churches also came into existence, uh, Seventh Day Adventist, a few churches like that, the Church of Christ. So Joseph Smith found these tablets, which he translated they from he was somehow given supernatural ability to translate these tablets and i'm i'm not saying that couldn't happen but all of a sudden the tablets disappeared and much of his translations disagree with the new testament yeah the t the tablets disappeared not only that not only did the tablets disappear and we can't see them anymore uh, which is one of the reasons why the Book of Mormon will not bear up under the kind of exegesis that we do uh, when we're doing theology uh, in, in Christianity. Because we go back and look at the original languages, Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and uh, some other uh, minor things that pop up. And we can go back and and evaluate how that has been translated what it could mean and sometimes we're discovering new information you can't do that with the book of mormon because there's there's no reformed egyptian tablets in gold that we can get our hands on well there's also no other books that substantiate what he said there's no archaeology there's no cities been found there's no none of the names he mentioned have been found no inscriptions in the hebrew or the reformed egyptian 
So one of the things that we do with, like you said, with the Bible is we go back to the ancient texts and by we, I mean, people a lot smarter than me, go back to the texts and make sure that it's correctly interpreted and not just someone's opinion. Now, he had done this during the second great awakening. And one of the things we've noticed during history is we have these revivals. We have these great periods of spirituality where people are, and we saw that clear back in first and second Kings yeah. where this has been ever since the history of man. Josiah and the, and the renewal, the, the restoration of the law and temple worship and the condemnation of all the Canaanite high places. Yeah. So this is this has been mankind's MO. We become very spiritual. We worship God. We honor him. And then as the generations go on, <coughs> they fall away. So you have these great awakenings. And I will say that we needed an awakening. We had fallen away. <coughs> yeah, the church in that in the first great awakening and the second great awakening uh, the church had become uh not <coughs> so much in faith but in intellectual um discussion of the bible and uh but in terms of people uh, uh coming to faith in christ that that had died off mm -hmm. and the revivals revived that and people be, can, began to be concerned about the um, um, people that were, were not saved. And a lot of them were hardworking uh, people with little or no education. And those are the people that also got involved sometimes um, in the in the great revivals, mm -hmm. uh, often God does use ordinary people. Usually, He uses ordinary people. <laughs> he seems to prefer using ordinary people, right? So this is not saying that He couldn't use Joseph Smith. What we're looking at and examining here is the evidence there to say He did. Yeah. Um, so he, he does adopt some of the characteristics of the Masons, like the secret handshakes and all those things. <coughs> yes. And all the rites and rituals of the Masons. Yes. He, uh, see, some of the other commonalities between the other restorationists were like a baptism for remission of sin. Yes, baptismal regeneration. Um, um, and that's... Uh, baptismal regeneration, <clears throat> the process is you come to faith in Christ. Now, uh, if you're a Calvinist, uh, you would say you don't come to faith in Christ, but because you're a part of the elect, God gives you great uh, faith to be able to uh, be saved by grace. I'm not a Calvinist, so I wouldn't say that. Uh, but, I was just wondering how they would stand up under our um, questions we ask cults. <laughs> you don't want to get into that. I, I don't want to go into that, so keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and so uh, coming to faith in Christ uh, is the first step, and then uh, repentance and um, that's something that I think uh, um, Christianity in the 21st century is kind of relaxed on. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, re you repented. People coming to receive Christ as their Savior repented, and they repented with godly sorrow. And uh, you, don't, you don't so much see that uh, being talked about or practiced or whatever. And then... Uh, baptism in water, and that's the point at which uh, you receive the remission of sin. 
and are born again. That's what <clears throat> regeneration means. However, and if you're hanging on a cross beside Jesus, you're probably not going to have time to be baptized. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And uh, for those of us who, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of 50-50 on baptismal regeneration. Um, yeah, I can see uh, that that is an important element in the in what I call the decision rights of coming to Christ, um, uh, being baptized in water. And uh, what I know from a 55-year uh, ministry as a pastor and missionary is that people who are baptized in water, um, uh, they stick around. They, they continue to be Christians on 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 in the main and so and people that have just lifted their hand in a crusade and prayed a magic prayer um uh, in shower. africa if you want to find the people who got saved in the last big crusade uh you go to the drinking bars they're there how many people got saved with uh, the the big crusade that was in town and you know two three people put their hands up <clears throat> but they're not they're they're not continuing to follow christ but the people who were discipled and water baptism is an important part of discipleship and following christ and so uh it is that the moment of regeneration i don't know maybe sometimes it is maybe sometimes it isn't you know, I don't uh, think that God has to always do it the same way. Yeah, I, 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 I've discovered over the years that God uh, uh, can do uh, some very remarkable things, and so I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not prepared to say that that doesn't happen or can't happen. What I would say is, um, and I understand. Uh, what happens and doesn't happen uh, from a theological point of view, but I'm I, I'm um, I'm comfortable with baptismal regeneration if that's uh, what what you are preaching. Um, you know, if you ever watch um, Phil Robertson, who has a YouTube channel called Unashamed, uh, he and and um, do you have the tornado there? No. I tried to throw my phone out the door. <laughs> It'll be an amber alert or something. Oh. Um, so uh, what will happen? What those guys are all uh, Church of Christ people, and you hear them talking about uh, being baptized. Uh, they, they have uh, newcomers that come to church, they come to faith in Christ as a result of testimonies and teaching one thing another, and they baptize them that Sunday, right then and there. And I, for me, I don't have a problem with that. But they do that because of their um, understanding of baptismal regeneration. And <clears throat> afterwards, uh, they also are prayed with to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit. I don't have any problem with that either, because that really mirrors in a lot of ways uh, exactly what um, New Testament or the early church Christians were doing and believing. So what we're seeing here on the baptism, um, the... Mormon Church is comparable in their belief in bapti baptism. Yeah, it, there are commonalities between uh, Mormonism and um, um, the mm -hmm. and and baptismal regeneration. Um, one of the things that helps there to be a a uh, connection or a commonality is the fact that Sidney Rigdon was uh, a close, close confidant 
and uh, and basically theologian uh, for Joseph Smith. And Sidney Rigdon had been a a uh, Christian Church Disciples of Christ Alexander Campbell follower, and those were things that that were taught in that church. Okay. Um, another note of commonality we noted was millennialism. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, both Sm Smith and Campbell both believe that this restoration of the proper New Testament Christianity would bring about the millennium sooner. Yes. Yes. And that we would be preparing for this new millennium. Now, uh, how that was all going to work out, um, you know, I think... I, I think there's various opinions on that. So we had uh, quoted last week that um, Joseph Fielding Smith had said that Mormonism, as it is called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith because it's all, it's all built on him as a cornerstone. He was either a prophet of God, divinely called, properly anointed and commissioned, or he was one of the biggest frauds this world has ever seen no middle ground. So if he was a deceiver, Joseph Fielding Smith said he should be exposed and his claims refuted and his doctrines shown to be false. So he believed that Joseph Smith was the real deal. So let's go into some of the articles of faith. Yeah, I, I wanted to take a look at some of the uh, articles of faith, the LDS articles of faith, and I'm taking this directly off from their website. And the first article of faith is this. <clears throat> uh, first article, we believe in God, the eternal father, and in his son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I don't know about you, but a lot of times uh, Christians who don't haven't really studied the Bible and haven't really been discipled well, uh, when they hear this, <clears throat> they're thinking this is about the Holy Trinity. But uh, it's not. And here's how the LDS Church explains their position. Uh, like many Christians, we believe in God the Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. However, we don't believe in the traditional concept of the Trinity. We believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three separate beings who are one in purpose. Um, and so uh, uh, that would be a that would be a heterodox or non-orthodox non understanding of the Godhead. And they use terms like uh, the Godhead uh, to describe this. It's not a trinity. It's actually a tritheism. And that's a little bit deceptive. But Christians that are unaware of basic Christian doctrine uh, can get fooled. So on some of these, it seems like we're splitting hairs as far as the definitions. And so I want to be really clear on um, it. It sounds similar, but it's different. Well, okay, let's let's take let's take a look at it. Um, like many Christians, we believe in God the Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Um, yes, uh, that sounds really that sounds really good. But here is the rub: we do not believe as Christians. We, we do not believe that the Son is separate from God the Father. Mm -mm. And we don't believe that the Holy Spirit is separate from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, that they are of the same essence. <clears throat> and, 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 you know, the Nicene Creed uh, talks about uh, uh, the Son. Very God of very God, light from light, uh, begotten, not born or created. 
And in the Mormon Trinity, um, yeah, uh, you have uh, you have the Father, uh, and then uh, the Son is a direct uh, descendant of the Father. But a that, physical descendant. Yes. Yes. And uh, the Holy Spirit um, uh, really becomes more like a force or a, 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 a spiritual influence. Uh, but the Bible reveals the Holy Spirit as a person with personality. We ran into that with Jehovah's Witness, too. Yeah, we did. The Holy Spirit's hard to understand and unless you actually have experience with the essence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the person. And and we um when when they when the Mormons state they believe in God, the eternal father, they also are thinking and conceiving of God the eternal father as uh being uh a corporal being in other words with a body but the scriptures teach us very clearly that god is a spirit and has no physical body and that means he's not limited to a physical body or to the dimensions of time and space he is the invisible eternal god and uh john writing in the first chapter of john verse 18 no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And that term there, the bosom of the Father, uh, that is a way of expressing how they are like one. You can't get any closer than to be in that person's bosom. Mm -hmm. And uh, then in John, John records Jesus as uh, pointing out that a person must be born of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. And since God is a Spirit, those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. So... And Jesus also said that if you've um, seen me, you've seen the Father. Mm -hmm. So he's like a, a physical manifestation of the presence of God. Is that a Yes. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1, and in the first uh, four or five verses, uh, he says, God, who in diverse manners, and in, in other words, in different ways, spoke to us uh, by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son. Let me pull that right up here because um, I, I, I just love this. Uh, I just love uh, the beginning of it. Uh, and I'm going to go to the NIV Bible and uh, pull that up. Um, and this is, this is what he, this is what he, he's saying here long ago at many times. And in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he inherited is more excellent than theirs. And to which of the angels God ever say, you are my son today, I've begotten you. So what about Exodus 33, 21? And the Lord says, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. While my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock 
and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Yeah, uh, when the Bible is talking about, uh, you know, God having a hand, he's having, uh, he, he uh, has eyes, the eye of the Lord is going throughout the earth, you know, um, those are anthropomorphisms, and that's a, that's a, a figure of speech that means uh, man-like. So this is figurative language, and it's being used to help us humans understand God in terms that are relatable to us. And it doesn't mean that God has literal eyes and ears or a strong ear to a, a strong arm to deliver or a hand to put over uh, uh, Moses. He has those functions, but he doesn't have those physical organs of a body. You know, we had talked a while back about the veil and yes. about the really like Michael Heiser calls it the unseen realm, that world that is through the veil that we can't see, but is happening while, while we're doing life here. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if at some point we will be able to see God because we'll be spiritual bodies like he is. Well, yeah. But right here, it's like when um, there's angels all around us that we can't see. Well, and and Hebrews he says uh, some people have entertained angels unawares. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, are there angels that uh, that come to our aid, and we we might not even we might not even recognize them. Um, and uh, yeah. I believe that God could take on the form of man because he did in Jesus. But to say that that is his natural form would be a stretch. That's correct. I mean, that's how that, I would agree with that. So uh, the Holy Spirit. Okay, first off, they had <laughs> they have a holy mother. Um, God had a wife and they got together and produced Jesus. Yeah, they produced uh, uh, a family uh, which Jesus was the older brother and oh. uh, Satan was a younger brother. Mm, okay, so Jesus is not a God to them. Uh, he, uh, Jesus is divine, uh, but not in the way that we think of Jesus being divine. Uh, but, but yeah, he, he is, he is a God, but he is not God. So I had read in one of these books, I'm, there's so many of them, <laughs> uh, that God, the father was once a man who later became a God. Yes. And so that, that speaks to the eternal nature of God. And his, uh, how could he once have been a man and then became a God? Um, and this, um, this book by Hendrickson publisher says that the father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's is, but we've already talked about that aspect of it. And then the Holy Ghost, it says it's a spirit in the form of a man. Um, this book doesn't have any more on that, but I have read more on it in one of these other books. So the Holy Spirit is, they don't have a real, do they not have a real clear doctrine on that? Well, they do. And they, and they, uh, they seem to, um, uh, um, rely on the Holy Spirit for all kinds of things. 
But in some cases, I mean, it's the, this is the same even with, uh, with traditional Christians. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is more an expression of what I want at, to have happen or, or uh, think should be. And uh, I can proclaim that in the name of, of God because the Holy Spirit revealed that to me. But here's the deal. Um, as most people know, I, I grew up in, and have a Pentecostal background. And, um, and so, um, you know, Pentecostals uh, do believe in prophecy and in prophets. And we, we can get into that a little bit later in this, uh, in these statements of faith. But the one sure thing is that the Holy Spirit would never uh, guide someone uh, to do something wrong, to do something sinful, to do something criminal, and he would never deny uh, the word of God. And so whatever a prophet is saying had better be grounded back in uh, the revelation uh, that is in uh, the revelation that we have uh, in the in the Holy Scriptures. So that's 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 very different from saying, "Well, the Holy Ghost gave all of this information out, and uh, it's new information, so it can contradict uh, what was in the the Scripture." Now, we do know from the Bible, and I believe that we talked about the Mormons believe this also, that the Holy, the, um, a prophet is accurate. They're, they're not wrong. Yeah. Um, and then there's so many, then there's so many instances where prophet was wrong. Right. And if, if the prophet's wrong, if God didn't change his mind. He, he already knew what was going to happen. God, God is the same yesterday, today, and always. So he didn't change his mind. If there's a change in what the word the prophet spoke, that just means the prophet changed his mind or he's not hearing from God. Yeah. Yes. So when we see 3,000 changes to the Book of Mormon, that would be a red flag for me. Because even according to their own beliefs, that that can't happen. Well, and then, you know, there's another aspect of the the Book of Mormon and changes that have been made to the Book of Mormon. Um, and, and to be honest and to be fair, we'd have to say that a lot of them were corrections of some bad spelling and grammar. Yeah. Um, but... <clears throat> Many, many, many of the, the distinctive Mormon doctrines, uh, like the restoration of the uh, priesthood, uh, the Aaronic priesthood, uh, the Melchizedek priesthood, um, celestial marriage, uh, temple rites, um, uh, I, mean, I could go on and on. None of that is found in the Book of Mormon. Zip. So how is, okay, but that's considered authentic. Did that come from Joseph Smith? Yes, it came from Joseph Smith in further revelations. But Joseph Smith seemed to have convenient um, further um, revelations. Um, and polygamy was one of those things. And, uh, and his wife, Emma, was, uh, was, was not on board with that. Okay, so we got to talk about the book of Abraham, <laughs> since we're talking about prophecy and revelations and that. So the book of Abraham was some papyrus scrolls that um, Joseph Smith purchased, correct? Um, yes. Um, I, think, I think the idea is that his mother purchased that for him. Okay. And he interpreted them by from um, 
this form of Egyptian by divine revelation or however he put it. And so they wrote the Book of Mormon. Uh, is that the, or not the Book of uh, Abraham? Is that the one that part of the book di disappeared and he had to start over? Uh, no, those are the 116 lost verses, but, okay. but we can get into that a little bit later. The book of the book of Abraham, uh, they, 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 they after uh, Napoleon had taken his armies to Egypt, uh, there was a lot of plundering and looting of, um, of things from Egypt that came on the market and people were making money selling. And so these um, papyrus writings um, were being sold and uh, nobody knew what they said because um, uh, the Rosetta Stone hadn't yet been, um, had not yet been, um, um, I don't want to say translated, but yeah, uh, the, the hieroglyphics, um, of Egyptian hieroglyphics had um, Greek and uh, other language that I can't remember. Um, and, and the treaty was written in three languages. And so because Greek was there, uh, they were able to figure out what the, what the hieroglyphs meant. Well, that hadn't been done at that time or it wasn't really public at that time. And so, uh, um, Joseph Smith uh, uh, translated the Reformed Egyptian that was on the uh, on the on the papyrus, and uh, um, and and who would ever know, you know, who would ever know what it all meant? And then years later, uh, when people had really uh, refined their understanding of Egyptian hieroglyphics, uh, the, the scrolls were uh, uh, given to a scholar uh, to do translation, and it wasn't even close uh, to uh, what Joseph Smith had translated. And I think now, today, uh, the Mormon church is saying that, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't intended to be a translation, but that as, you know, uh, Joseph Smith was struggling to learn about the uh, Reformed Egyptian, God was giving him additional kinds of revelation and it got written down. And so while the story is a little um, faulty, uh, they want to continue to cling uh, to the product of that story, the product of of Joseph Smith's translation. And um, I think that's a weak argument. Joseph Smith was not considered a, you know, if you look back at who he was in the community, he wasn't exactly considered counted among one of the upstanding men of integrity and religious learning in the community, was he? Well, he gets portrayed as kind of the, the, the rural, you know, bumpkin uh, farm boy. Uh, but his, his older brother went to Dartmouth College. Wow. And so, uh, you know, he, he was an avid reader and and he was going around you know finding libraries and reading books and um he actually was quite uh quite intelligent charismatic and he had um he, and he was well read uh and and some of the ideas that were afloat uh, i call it the stew that, that he came out of uh, because there were all kinds of really interesting ideas that were being tried out. Um, yeah, some of those wind up in the Book of Mormon. And um, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in theology and 
Uh, we have a, a term, it's a German term that you have to learn, sits and leaving, the, the setting in life. And if you take a look at the sits and leaving of uh, the Book of Mormon is definitely early 19th century setting. Even though it purports uh, to go uh, to be an ancient record, um, the issues that are being dealt with, the ideas that are being, uh, they, they all come out of that stew uh, that Joseph Smith was living in. So let's talk about sin. Oh. We had been, we'd mentioned before that we haven't, a Christian church here, and I need to, <laughs> thank you for correcting me. I need to clarify when I'm saying the church, I'm referring to the church I know, which is the Western church. Yes. And I hear great things about the church in Africa and, and parts of Asia, right? Oh, yeah. So in the Western church, and hey, y'all send some missionaries over here. We need, we need them back. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so in the Western church, we rarely preach anymore about sin because it's not politically correct. We don't talk about repentance very much. M Mike and I go to church pretty regularly and in the past three years, we've probably heard two sermons on repentance and salvation. And one of them was his mom's funeral. Yeah. So, are they doing better than us on this? <laughs> well, here's the second, the second statement in the statement of faith of the uh, LDS church. And it says, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's sin. Now, um, in Untangle LDS, this. <laughs> um, in LDS, uh, 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 thinking Adam is a significant person and he has a, a, a nearly divine uh, stature. And um, Brigham Young, when he was the um, when he was the prophet and president uh, of the LDS Church, uh, he introduced. Um, a, a, a doctrine that is called the Adam, uh, the Adam God uh, 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 theology, and this was in the Spring General Conference in April 9th of 1852. But the church has uh, backed away from that. But he, Adam still plays a big place in the L, uh, LDS es eschatology. Um, and so uh, in Mormon theology, Adam and Eve fell into sin as a part of God's eternal plan, but they were purged of sin when maybe Adam sacrificed an animal on the altar at Adam Amenundi. Uh, and this is a place uh, that is the location of the Garden of Eden. And it's, it's about uh, a, a good six, seven hour drive uh, from where I'm sitting right now in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It is in Missouri. Okay. I have a time out here. I, I think Missouri is a pretty cool state, but I think it's a stretch to call it Eden. Um, yeah, it, it, it was a, it was a stunningly beautiful place at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, 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 Joseph Smith had found a stack of uh, uh, stones all all um, stacked up, and immediately said, "This is the this is the altar where Adam sacrificed uh, before God." Okay, and he would have found these about what year? Uh, it's going to be in the it's going to be in the uh, early eighteen thirties. So it could have been, there's a lot of native tribes in that area. Yes. Uh, there's, in fact, there's quite a few burial mounds there. Yeah. 
I mean, who knows what it was? It doesn't yes. exist anymore. So we don't know how to, we don't know how to do that. Myself, personally, I have actually been to uh, Adam Amon Ondi and um, uh, with a group that I was that I was driving. I've actually been to that location and people get very emotional about it. And one of the things is that uh, in Mormon theology, when Christ, before Christ returns in a way that every eye will see him, um, uh, he's going to initially return to uh, Adam Amanondi in uh, Missouri. And there, uh, everyone who has received the keys uh, of the kingdom, keys of priesthood, are going to hand in their keys to the person who brought them, and they will hand in their keys and so forth until all of the keys are um, uh, in the hand are with Adam, and then he is going to uh, hand all of these uh, to Christ, and. Um, so Adam's kind of a middleman for them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I struggle with that. It's a, Don't we hand our crowns to Christ? Lay them at his feet? Yeah, whatever reward that I, that I accrue mm -hmm. um, from faithfully following the Lord um, is going to go back to him anyway. Right. But, um, but this idea, but the idea of the keys and, and priesthood and all of that, and and it all taking place in at uh, um, this field in Missouri. Um, there, I mean, the number of people who would have to be there, the place would not be able to contain. So, so but each man is held accountable for their and punished for their own sins. Well, the Bible is clear about Adam and sin. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, Paul writes to us, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. So um, the... the Sin came into the world through one man. That was Adam. And we uh, can go on with that verse. He writes further, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So uh, Adam's sin has spread to all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and Romans chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And this is, this is the part that is, that is really important uh, to get a hold of. Um, the Romans chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trans, uh, trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, there it is, so the act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. So, yes, uh, Adam's sin is a part of our makeup. And, uh, and yes, uh, there is a judgment on our own sin. But Adam brought sin into the world and death passed 
upon all men. Um, okay, we have we have come to the end. Oh no! And, and I was just getting ready to preach. I there's some stuff in here I want to go into because one of the questions that we've had over and over again over the past four weeks is hell. And I think that what we're talking about right here with judgment, um, we're going we're going to pick up here next week because this. I'm seeing here that judgment might be a little bit different before the law than after the law and after Jesus. I'm just throwing that out there and we'll talk about yeah, it yeah. next week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Old Testament talks about it. That's for sure. When it says yeah. that, you know, in the time of man's innocency and, and, and that, that God winked at sin mm -hmm. in the same way that we kind of wink at at our you children know, kids you yeah know, it's like you see your little kid doing something it's not you know it's not the best thing but you realize you, but if they did the same thing 10 years later there would be a much more significant yeah. consequence yeah. so okay we're going to jump into that next week because we've hit it we've hit the end <laughs> yes we have and we want to say thank you uh, to you for being a part of our podcast today. Uh, we do love people. We're not out here uh, trying to condemn them. And we don't uh, believe God is condemning them at this moment either. So uh, we want to just invite you to come along with us uh, and uh, learn more about the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you so much for joining us. God bless you all.